Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston Station, I'm ready for the event. Motherboard, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Motherboard. How do you hear me? I've got you loud and clear, and I'm ready for your questions. Great. Thank you so much for taking my call. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Beam today, and I was wondering if you can describe what it was like entering it for the first time. Well, Beam is one example of uh, uh, new technology, of course, being brought to the International Space Station to prove out that new technology. And it, of course, it, so it was a first. It was a, a major first, uh, a first in terms of uh, its design concept. Um, and of course, uh, certainly on board the International Space Station. So, like like many first, many milestones. It's exciting to be um, to be part of it, and and I was honored to uh, to have that role, uh, to be able to enter it and outfit it and get it up and running uh, for its uh, time here on station. Great. Can you um, describe the inflation process for me? Well, the. the um, um, inflation process was um, we used a small amount of air to get a small amount of pressure to inflate it and it had uh, some uh, rip stop or rip stitching inside and a mechanical device that would control the inflation uh, so we inflated it just a little bit at a time uh, to try to get it fully deployed before we really pressurized it uh, the it took a little bit longer, as you know. It took uh, we we uh, uh, did not uh, get it inflated the first day, and we came back another day after the ground team spent some time looking at it. It took a little bit more force than we expected uh, to get it deployed, but it deployed uh, eventually, um, and it's uh, in a nominal configuration. Um, and again, uh, it went very well after that first uh, day's scrub. Great. Now, is the air inside the beam any different from the rest of the station, temperature-wise? When I first went in, it was a little bit cooler, and that's just because we didn't have climate control going on in there, and that was predicted, and it wasn't over, it wasn't uncomfortable or anything. It was just a little bit cooler. Uh, it also had a new car smell, as you might expect, with the new materials that hadn't been exposed to uh, the wear and tear of, of life on board the International Space Station. Um, and one of the first things that I, I did is I got uh, ventilation up and running, so we were exchanging air uh, between the International Space Station and the beam module. So it quickly, um, the, the new car smell uh, quickly went away. Uh, so other than that, there was no, no significant difference. Great. Now, is a habitat module like the beam any more or less sensitive to things like micrometeorites or space debris? Well, I'm not uh, totally familiar with the technology that's in the, the beam design, uh, but I'm certain it includes uh, design concepts that which would be a protection against micrometeorite uh, hits. Uh, as you probably know, we're not leaving the hatch open. It's uh, closed, although we do have ventilation going back and forth through um, uh, hoses between the station and beam, uh, but we're keeping the hatch closed. Um, it, its design concept is much different than station. Uh, I've trusted it has protection, uh, but how, well, how that protection compares to the International Space Station, I really can't speak to. Okay, thank you. Um, how do you think a module like BEAM will affect the future of living and working in space? Well, as you might know, it took almost 40 space shuttle flights, I think 37 or 38 space shuttle flights to support the space station assembly over many years. And it took an equal amount of Russian rocket launches to get the, the Russian part up here uh, and then to put it together. Um, that's a lot of rocket launches. And when you launch something on a rocket, you want the volume that you're launching, the spacecraft that you're launching, you want it to be volumetrically efficient. So you want it packed just as full of things as you can. However, uh, for a spacecraft that uh, is going to have people, a crew living on board, you need open volume, like you see here uh, right now, uh, for the crew to live and work in. 
Uh, so we launched a lot of open volume on the International Space Station just by virtue of, of the requirement uh, to be able to live and work it, on board this orbital complex. Uh, the beam concept gives us the, uh, the opportunity perhaps in the future to launch um, components of spacecraft or habitats or, or uh, whatever uh, you, you uh, might imagine uh, for a, um, a habitable uh, um, uh, destination in space to be able to launch it volumetrically more efficient and then to inflate it later to get the volume you need, the open volume inside for the crew to, uh, to live and work. Great, thank you. Now I know that you shared a really nice picture of the strawberry moon the other day taken from the space station. How do you feel that social media has changed the business of being an astronaut? Well, uh, you know, what we do up here is, uh, we think is of value to the public, to the people of, of the United States and the partnership and the entire world. Uh, and one of the things we've struggled with in the past is, is getting the word out uh, that uh, we, uh, we're, we're flying and, and the, the, what we're doing on board the space station. After the space shuttle retired, or since it retired, I often get questions out in public settings that, uh, well, I didn't know we were flying. We're still flying. And I say, yeah, we've had continuous human presence for over 15 years, 15 and a half years now on board the International Space Station. So, and the public was largely unaware of it. Uh, so social media is a great means uh, to keep people aware of uh, what we're doing up here. Um, so it, has it changed uh, the life of an astronaut? Certainly it, it, um, it uh, gets you uh, um, certainly more in touch uh, with the public. Uh, we're largely unknown uh, nowadays, unlike uh, the, uh, the 1960s, um, because of the, the coverage. Uh, the coverage is different, right, and the public attention is different. Um, and unknown is okay, um, but social media is obviously making, uh, making the crews known as well as the, what we're doing up here. And, the, um, and by virtue of that, making the entire international partnership known to the public at large. Great, thank you. Could you talk about some of, briefly about a couple of the science experiments that you're working on right now? Well, I just outfitted uh, an experiment in the uh, Japanese module this morning to go in the airlock to go outside and spend a, a fair amount of time outside. It's an exposed, it's got different kinds of materials uh, and whatnot that is going to be exposed to the environment of space outside for a period of time and then brought back in in the future. And then scientists on the ground will study those things. Uh, that's one example. Um, we do a variety of experiments up here, as you know, across the whole spectrum of science disciplines from material science to biological science, plants, animals, uh, bugs, microbes. Um, Probably the most interesting in the, the, the broadest uh, study area that we have up here on board the International Space Station, though, is the study of the human body and the effects of the weightless environment and the space environment on the human body, which is very important so that we can understand those effects, developing, develop uh, mitigation for those effects uh, to f support future exploration wherever we go beyond low Earth orbit. Great. Thank you so much. You're very welcome, Amy. Good talking to you. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the motherboard portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from CBS News. So you and Alexia and Oleg uh, are going to have the station to yourselves for another week or so. Uh, between now and the arrival of your next crewmates, uh, your Russian colleagues are going to test the Toru navigation system or the rendezvous system on the Progress 62 vehicle. I'm wondering if you could tell me a little about that test and why that's important to you guys. Well, as you know, the, on the Russian side, they've been upgrading the Soyuz and Progress um, periodically over the years. And this is part of a test of that of that uh, uh, latest upgrade. Uh, very important. The last uh, couple of progresses have been the, um, the the modified version of the Progress, which uh, uh, is in terms of its navigation capability and its guidance uh, to rendezvous with the space station, is a big step forward in, uh, from what they had previously. And the Progress uh, 
sort of runs um, pilot flights, if you will, ahead of the Soyuz, and th this next Soyuz is going to use that upgraded system. Uh, so this test is, is supporting the, the uh, operational development, if you will, of that upgrade of the, of the new guidance and navigation control system of the Progress and Soyuz families of vehicles. So very important uh, to get it right. Uh, obviously, when we're doing new things like that, sometimes we, uh, we miss something now and then, um, and that's why we do those testing, just to catch those misses and to get them corrected as efficiently as possible. So I guess it'll be a, a manual docking of the progress, and then if that goes well, uh, you'll welcome three new crewmates uh, on July 9th with that new Soyuz MS vehicle you were talking about. Other than the, the rendezvous and nav sort of upgrades, what other safety improvements, are, or maybe they're not safety-related, but what other improvements are you uh, looking forward to in the new MS series of the Soyuz? Well, it, it's it, like I said, it's got a modified control system and uh, guidance and navigation. It will get its state vector from the equivalent of uh, GPS, the Russian equivalent to GPS. So it doesn't require ground passes over ground sites in uh, the greater Russian area like previous vehicles. So that makes the vehicle a little bit more robust uh, in that sense. And it's just a, uh, it's a big step forward. It's got more digital capability. And of course, as we know, as we've been adding computers to all sorts of things that everybody works with in life, that gives greater capability. So it's, it's just a normal progression, step-by-step -step advancement of technology and, and performance uh, for that vehicle. Well, let's shift gears a little bit here. I know you're probably getting tired of questions about the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module, or BEAM as it's known, but let me throw one or two at you. I'm just curious what your impressions were when you went inside and what your thoughts are about that technology in general for perhaps making station modules more affordable or, or habitat modules for deep space missions, uh, you know, more of a reasonable proposition. I mean, just what your impressions are. Well, I was honored to be part of uh, that operation, to be able to go in the beam and to, to get it outfitted uh, for its uh, time on the space station. Uh, going in, of course, it was like uh, entering a new car. It had that new car smell. Uh, it was a, The air was a little bit cooler than on board the space station, uh, but that's because it, it wasn't environmentally controlled, and it was as predicted and not uh, uncomfortably cool, just noticeably cool. Uh, I think it, uh, it ha is a concept, a design co concept that holds great promise to be able to more efficiently launch elements of a spacecraft or habitats uh, going to a surface of another body, uh, for example, um, on fewer, uh, using fewer rocket launches, uh, volumetrically efficient. That is, you know, when, like I, when I'm floating in here inside the laboratory module, when this thing launched, it's big, and it launched on the space shuttle, which, uh, of course, is very big, and, and it took many space shuttle launches to, uh, to get the space station up here. Uh, and we want to volumetrically use everything we can uh, on a rocket launch. Uh, so, but this wasn't filled. This was empty space, so we were launching empty space. So the, the concept that the beam uses, uh, inflatable, means that you can launch more volumetrically efficient and then inflate uh, components to get that habitable volume that you need for crews to live and work. And again, changing the subject just a little bit, uh, looking ahead to the next SpaceX launch, of course, you got a docking adapter on board, and I guess you and Kate Rubens will be installing that somewhere toward the end of August in a spacewalk. How are your spacesuits doing? Uh, are they now ready to go, given these recent issues you guys had with some unexpected water buildups? Well, as far as I know, we're on track uh, for the spacesuits to uh, to be uh, operationally ready to support those spacewalks that we plan on doing in uh, in the August about the August time frame. Um, I just completed routine maintenance on all four spacesuits that we have on board, and and that went well. Um, and um, so so far they're holding up. The as you know, we've had some issues over the last couple of years, and the the teams on the ground have have done a stellar work to work through those issues to make sure that we have that capability. It's a capability that's very critical, of course, to supporting the ongoing life of the space station. Hey, you know, we're uh, getting ready for the July 4 holiday down here, and since you're the only American on board right now, I don't suppose there's, <laughs> there's much you're going to do to mark the event in space, but uh, will you at least get some time off? Uh, yeah, we'll get a little bit of time off. There's never a day here that's truly completely off. There's always things to do. Uh, but it's nice to have a day that's uh, mostly unscheduled, 
so you can spend the time um, doing the things that you want to do and also do a little bit of personal time. And of course, uh, so I'll, I'll be doing that on July 4th. I'll be uh, communicating with friends and family on the ground uh, to participate with them in celebrating the holiday. And also, even though this is, I'm the only American on board, uh, in this international partnership, we tend to celebrate each other's holidays together and to support each other in that effect. So I, I expect good support out of my Russian colleagues on the 4th of July. Hey, thanks. You know, one of my radio colleagues was wondering if astronauts can ever see fireworks from up in space. And I realized that, you know, the timing is everything. You've got to be over the states or something. It's got to be nighttime. You've got to be awake, et cetera, et cetera. But have you ever heard of anyone ever seeing fireworks for, from space or, uh, or do you even think you could? Uh, I do not re recall uh, a case where somebody has been able to see it. I was up here on a previous 4th of July, and I did spend some time trying to uh, get a sighting on fireworks, and I was, uh, I was not able to do that. And obviously, as you said, uh, the lighting and the, or the timing is very important. You've got to have clear weather. It's got to be night going over the U.S., uh, and, uh, and, and then you have to be able to, to go over the spot where you can spot the fireworks. Uh, depending upon our timing uh, this time, I'll certainly be looking out the window if we're over the U.S. at uh, nighttime to see if I can uh, do that this time. Hey, one last question, Jeff. Uh, you know, Scott Kelly logged 520 days in space on his four missions, and you're going to exceed his record, I think, on August 24th. And when you land in September, I think you move up to number 14 in the world or something like that. Is there any significance to records like that in your mind, or is that just something that, that comes and goes for you? Uh, for me, it mostly comes and goes. The numbers don't really uh, mean that much to me. The, the, the content of, uh, of, um, of what we've done, I think, matters more. Um, and when people ask me about that in, in my career, I immediately think about the space station itself. And I've been honored to be from end to end, uh, from the very beginning of the space station involved, and then through uh, midway in the assembly, and then assembly complete, and now and the, the full utilization of the space station. I'm more honored by that than the total time that I've been up here. And it also get, is a testimony to the, to the international team that made this uh, orbital outpost uh, so incredible and, and possible. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it very much. Uh, have a great rest of your flight and look forward to talking to you down the road. Thank you, Bill. Great talking to you today. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes our event.